I'm Christian Bryant. This is a show that takes the news tone down from business casual to just casual. In fact, at this hour, comfy would be entirely appropriate. So feel free to kick back and let us tell you a bit about what's going on in the world around you. Cool? Cool. Here's what we got for y'all. The trial of the men accused of killing Ahmad Arbery is underway. We're focusing our attention on citizens' arrest laws, which is a part of the argument from the defense. And we'll update you on what's happened so far. Plus, US reopened its borders for fully vaccinated travelers from 33 countries. We'll take a look into some of the reunions happening at a DC airport. But first, this week, the Country Music Awards are celebrating the best of country music. So here's a question for you. What is country music. Picture it in your head. I know what you're probably thinking. White dude, maybe in a cowboy hat singing about his truck or women, maybe a cold one or a little bit of whiskey. That may be the brand of country music you still hear most on the radio, but it doesn't include a whole lot of other music that is still a part of the genre and a growing part at that. With everything I got. But in a perfect world, when they said I was different. Despite the growing diversity of country music today, it's often been tougher for black folks and women who are artists to even be considered country. Just last month, Casey Musgraves objected to the Recording Academy's decision not to count her most recent album, Starcrossed, as eligible for country categories at the upcoming Grammys. And in 2019, Billboard briefly removed Lil Nas X's Old Town Road from its hot country chart since it believed the song didn't have enough country elements. That more limited view of country music can tie back to what ends up being played on the radio. Studies done by musicologist Jada Watson of the University of Ottawa found that just 10% of songs played on country radio stations are by women, and that number goes down to 2.3% for artists of color. Many stations allegedly have used unwritten rules around this, including one to never play two songs by women back to back, and racial issues have cropped up even this year in the country industry. Chart-topping singer Morgan Wallen was caught on camera earlier this year shouting the N-word. And while his music was taken off Spotify country playlists and he was banned from events like this week's CMA Awards, his album stayed at number one after the video came out. Journalist and New York Times bestselling author Andrea Williams says incidents like that are about more than just one artist. It is really about what is the message that we're sending to the people who we've closed the door on for a hundred years? who we said maybe we are trying to make room for now, what are we saying to them? And while country has long been the domain of mostly white male artists, the genre originated in part from the black community. <laughs> Early stars like D. Ford Bailey, the first performer ever introduced on the Grand Ole Opry, helped shape country starting in the 1920s. And in the 1960s, Ray Charles and Charlie Pride broke new ground in the genre. Country music's black roots have been there from the very beginning. Black people have been influencing country, been present in country, been part of the country audience for the history of it. Alice Randall is a professor and writer in residence at Vanderbilt University. She's taught classes on black country, but made history by becoming the first black woman to write a chart-topping country song when she wrote X's and O's for Trisha Yearwood in 1994. Appreciation of the matriarchal society is a very black phenomenon in America. Reverence for land is something that many scholars think that the Southerners got from the African influence. Appreciation of outlaw sensibility is something coming from people who had to steal away to freedom when it was illegal for you to be able to read or own yourself or move about in country owes something to black roots, in my opinion. While black artists and musical traditions have deep roots in country music, it's a different story with the country music industry. In the 1920s, early record labels segregated genres and decided to sell country music to white audiences. The industry reflected that decision for generations. And even today, the path forward for black country stars could be tougher without also making sure there are black decision makers behind the scenes. All of these other people, black managers, black publishers that help to drive this industry industry along and can also advocate for Black artists on the inside, we don't have that and we're not having that conversation yet. But a new set of up and coming artists are hoping to shake up country music and bring it back to its more diverse roots. At the CMA Awards this week, two of the five nominees for New Artist of the Year, Jimmy Allen and Mickey Guyton, 
are black. And Guyton's nomination is the first time a black female artist has been nominated for an individual award. It comes at a time when the cradle of the country music industry, the South, is going through major demographic changes. According to a Brookings Institution analysis of Census Bureau data, Texas, Georgia, and Florida have been the states with the largest growth in black population over the last decade. Thanks in part to the shift in the Atlanta area, Georgia's black population has nearly doubled since 1990. In an increasingly diverse South, black artists are pushing for the country industry to be more representative of its roots. One artist that's been at the forefront of that push is Reese Palmer. Uh, her 2007 hit, Country Girl, made the Billboard charts and made her the first black female artist to chart a country song in two decades. Now she's the host of Color Me Country, an Apple Music radio show that highlights BIPOC country artists. She has also established a fund to help support up-and-coming country artists of color, and she's here with us on ITL. Reese Palmer, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. How do you feel that, you know, your identity as a as a black woman uh, making country music? How do you feel that impacted your ability to, you know, get in front of people in the way that you that you wanted to? I think that it's a double-edged sword. In a lot of ways, people would take the meeting because they want to meet the black woman that's singing these songs. Um, in the very beginning, they would play uh, my music before they would show my picture. And that felt really strange to me. I've also had situations where my color was a roadblock, like where people just flat out said, I don't want her, you don't even have to bring her to the station, like I wouldn't, I won't ever play her. You have people wanting to give you authenticity tests. Or I remember having a debate when we were discussing imaging for me and trying to decide if I should wear my hair natural. I've been wearing my hair natural since I was 17 years old. There are a number of black country artists who I, I feel like I can, I could list off the top of my head um, because you don't see so many, at least for me. Right. Um, you've, you've had conversations with these people. I'm thinking of uh, the Pointer Sisters, Darius Rucker, Mickey mm -hmm. Guyton. Um, what has struck you the most uh, from your conversations about the role black artists have had uh, in shaping what country is today? One of the biggest realizations that I've had in doing these interviews is number one, how similar all of our experiences are as far as like growing up and listening to country along with gospel, along with R&B, and like how we all kind of came to it in, a, in, in very similar ways. I was really just surprised at the amount of artists and like this moment that country music is having right now has happened before. I think that was probably the most surprising thing to me was just how cyclical this all is and which got me to thinking, how can we, how can we make it stick this time? I wanted to talk about the the, the fund that you created um, with your show to help independent uh, country artists of color. Um, what sort of difference have you seen uh, that help make for up and coming artists, uh, and and why has it been hard for them to gain support um, to begin with? The fund was started um, in December of last year of 2020 and like we announced on December 14th one of the things that we talked about extensively was just how when you're pursuing music um finances can be the make or break for you and I mean like sometimes you're trying to make decisions about whether or not you're going to pay your rent or you're going to do a demo or you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna shoot a video or you're gonna eat. And I think, especially for artists of color, you have these, these added barriers and hurdles that you're trying to get through and trying to make it in a genre where you're not like overly represented. So I didn't want money to be a reason why someone left. You mentioned an authenticity test. Um, I know that this isn't a standardized test, <laughs> but I imagine, you know, people who people who are in country music, they want to know that, like, somebody's country enough. I mean, what does that look like or what did it look like for you? I think it's it's become like we've been sold this message so well that 
you know, country music is only for white people that it's a real, like, it was a concern. And, um, and, and anytime that a black person or a person of color was trying to get in, it was obviously for some other reason. I remember once going to a radio station and while we were live, they start playing these obscure country songs and trying to see if I knew what they were. And some of them I had no clue. And then some of them, like I knew, cause I, I'm a music head on top of being a musician. Like I just love music. And it struck me as odd, but I didn't really say anything. Like I said, they're microaggressions are what we call them now. And um, I don't think people realize how that kind of eats at you and picks at you and, and makes you even second guess yourself. I want to thank you for, you know, kind of laying out your knowledge and your expertise. Uh, Reese Palmer, musician, podcaster, uh, and somebody we had a lot of fun talking to. Thank you so much for being on In The Loop. Thank you. All right, folks, it's time for us to take a quick break. But when you're back, we'll break past our two-factor authentication and screen time limitations to tell you what's circulating on social media. Newsy Tonight is changing the conversation. Incredible footage coming in live right now. Away from opinions and arguments. Tell our viewers how people there are preparing for the next extreme weather event. Primetime news focused on facts understanding this is an investigation you will only see here tonight reporting what matters and why it matters to you we're not really as divided as it may seem let's break down our latest newsy poll newsy tonight weeknights at 8 7 central only on newsy Welcome back, gang. What happens in the age of working from home when your Wi-Fi goes out? It becomes a trending topic, of course. Here's what's percolating on social media. Xfinity caught some heat today because of a cross-country outage of its internet service that affected tens of thousands of customers. According to an outage map, there were service disruptions in the Northeast, Midwest, Pacific Northwest, and parts of California. So basically, everywhere except the South. The outage started overnight for some people on the West Coast. And when customers couldn't get a hold of customer support over the phone, they jumped on Twitter to look for help. Now, when they say it goes down in the DMs for Xfinity, that meant fielding complaints from people trying to figure out what the heck was going on, which is the least fun way to use DMs. Xfinity has yet to comment on the reason for the outage, but reported that they had begun restoring service to some customers. Low key, I was hoping for a disruption in here so I could take an eight hour lunch, but no dice. What good is a three ton satellite orbiting the planet with high tech cameras and sensors if you can't do stuff like track climate change? Luckily, we don't have to find out considering the latest NASA and US Geological Survey satellite, Landsat 9, just beamed back images of our changing planet. The images seen here are meant to provide critical observations about things like drought conditions in the Navajo Nation, glaciers melting and forming lakes in the Himalayas, and our changing coastlines and sea level rise in places like the Florida Panhandle. NASA doesn't exactly tell us what Landsat means, land satellite, but it's a program made up of satellites that observe the Earth. The Landsat program, which was started in the 70s, holds the record for providing us with the longest running view of Earth from outer space. And according to NASA, that's an important vantage point for decision makers all over the world when it comes to climate change. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson reiterated that, telling attendees at COP26, the US agency wants to increase understanding of our home planet using Earth-observing satellites and instruments. The pandemic has caused a shortage of truck drivers at a time when the supply chain has been severely disrupted. But Walmart said, who needs a human behind the wheel anyway? The retail chain announced two self-driving trucks have been operating a route in Arkansas since August without a human chaperone. The trucks have been deployed to help the company's online grocery business. The move to driverless has been in the works for a while now. The program began in December of 2020 after Walmart and a Silicon Valley startup got approval from the Arkansas State Highway Commission. The safety driver or somebody behind the wheel to take the reins in case something goes awry was pulled over the summer. Right now, the move is still really, really small scale. Two box trucks are only operating in Bentonville, Arkansas, shuttling goods on a seven mile route between a Walmart fulfillment center and one of its neighborhood markets. 
On Monday, we got to look at what it meant for the southern border to reopen to vaccinated visitors. But the thing is, it wasn't just physical land borders that reopened. This week, there have been reunions at airports across the country because fully vaccinated travelers from 33 countries can once again fly into the US. For some, that meant getting the opportunity to see loved ones for the first time in more than a year and a half. The Washington Post video team talked to visitors arriving at Dulles International Airport here in DC and caught some of the emotional reunions on camera. Every bit of me is just shaking with emotion and I just, yeah, it hasn't sunk in that I'm here yet. The last time I saw my family was February last year. No, two years ago. Last year, 2020, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I've been trying to get here ever since. So yeah, I decided I was going to be on the very first flight coming in here today. How do you know this? No, I think international, I talked to information, they said international comes out of the store. Oh, there she is. I see her. Well, I'm picking up my mom. She just arrived here from Germany, from Frankfurt, and I haven't seen her four years, about four years. We usually go and see each other every two years, so back and forth. She will come here a year and I'll go back to Germany for a year. But um, because of Corona, you know, <laughs> we weren't able to do anything like that. I'm here to visit my girlfriend, she's American. It's been very hard with all the restrictions because like we had to spend like a year and a half without seeing each other and then she was finally able to come when Europe opened up the restrictions but then the US was still you know everybody was still banned from traveling to the US so I had to wait until now to be able to, to travel. I actually booked my flight in advance and it happened to be exactly on the 8th oh, so I got lucky with that. I didn't need to reschedule. <laughs> Meeting my mom, she's flying from Kiev, Ukraine, and so we've been apart for oh, a little bit over a year now. And finally, when the border was open, she was able to, you know, get here. Originally, the tickets were a little earlier, so because we didn't really know and didn't didn't do our research about the ban, so we had to switch tickets again, and then yeah, finally. She's flying here today. Well, first of all, I didn't recognize her and I was waiting for her to call me. So I didn't realize she was already um, off the plane and ready to, you know, come out. <laughs> but no exciting and I didn't expect. I actually had tears in my eyes. <laughs> I didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> uh, I'm here to see my girlfriend. Um, she's German and she's coming in the first day she's allowed to come back in. So it'd be nice if we could get back to normal. Um, I, I'm glad that we finally reopened the borders. I mean, she's fully vaccinated, I'm fully vaccinated. Um, you know, it'd be nice when we finally round the corner on this COVID thing. I think COVID, I think COVID really got to all of us. And I work as a registered nurse and I've seen what's going on. And I didn't want her to come for the same reason. I didn't want to get her sick. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a wild road. It's been an experience, but it's one that didn't have an end in sight, which was the hardest thing. You couldn't plan for anything. But and then it suddenly happened. Yeah. 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 Thanks to modern medicine and <laughs> yeah. vaccines, this yeah. has become a reality. So I feel safe for her to come here now after she has her booster. And I'm about to get mine tomorrow. Um, so I, I feel that it is time for family to come back to reunite and not pretend that COVID is not here, but to actually live again, you know, see each other hugs. I'm happy, <laughs> excited. Ah, no words. <laughs> well, you made it. A big shout out to our partners at the Washington Post for that reporting. After the break, we're taking a look at traffic stops and why one city is now banning police from pulling people over for specific violations. Sunday nights, Newsy takes you to the edge. Exploring untold stories, 
it's literally an existential threat. Going far beyond the headlines. Today, social media is the real world. Hey, grandkids. There needs to be a bridging of the gap. In real life, a Next Generation News Magazine. New episodes, Sunday nights at 8.30, 7.30 Central, only on Newsy. Here's a little FYI for you. Traffic stops are the most common way for police and civilians to interact with each other. And historically, when people of color in the U.S. get pulled over by the police, the outcome can quickly become violent or even deadly, especially for black men and women. Last week, Philly became the first city in the U.S. to ban police from pulling people over for low-level traffic violations. National correspondent Dan Grossman explains how this effort aims to help reduce racial profiling and serve as a model that can be adopted by other states and cities. When we are driving and those lights come on, most drivers have the universal response to pull over. But what comes next is far from universal. Being pulled over by police was what, what I would like to call a cultural norm. Isaiah Thomas grew up in a world where many of his life decisions were guided by this very scenario. We would purchase our car based on the likelihood of being pulled over or not being pulled over. Uh, the amount of people you would drive with would be predicated on this idea of not wanting to get pulled over. It's why last year, when he was elected as a council member at large for the city of Philadelphia, he campaigned on the platform that he'd change it. We feel like an entire generation um, can, can be changed as it relates to their perception of law enforcement and law enforcement relations. Last week, Philadelphia became the first major city in the country to ban police from pulling over drivers for these low-level traffic infractions, which alone used to warrant a stop. It's to reduce the profiling black men and women and other drivers of color say they face daily across the country. Their job as public servants are to try to reduce crime, so on occasion they pull people over in a traffic stop to try to see if they can get something probable cause to search the car. Stacy Hervey is a criminal justice professor and says data proves what black men and women have long suspected. They're pulled over at a disproportionately higher rate than white drivers. An analysis of 14 years of traffic stops by the University of South Carolina shows black drivers are 63% more likely to be pulled over than their white counterparts. And they're 115% more likely to be searched during that stop even though data shows contraband, like illegal guns or drugs, are found more often when a white driver is searched. It's one of the many reasons why another study of 95 million traffic stops by Stanford University concluded that police stops and search decisions suffer from persistent racial bias. Our past and how we were raised really does impact what we do, and I think is the more we realize that as a society and in police departments, the better off we're all going to be, and the better off police officers are going to be. In August, the city of Minneapolis proposed adopting similar measures that would ban traffic stops on certain grounds. And the state of Virginia did something similar in March when it said law enforcement could no longer stop drivers for a non-illuminated license plate, broken brake lights, or tinted windows. I think the main goal in passing this legislation was to put us in a position where uh, we can address the issue of driving while black. Philly's new law won't go into effect for another three months. But once it does, Councilman Thomas hopes its adoption becomes more universal nationwide. I'm Dan Grossman. Much appreciated, Dan. Meet us back here after the break, folks. We're talking about the latest updates in the case of the men accused of killing Ahmaud Arbery and what the defense plans to use for the basis of their argument. What do you think the future looks like? From Newsy, renowned journalists and filmmakers, comes a celebration of storytelling. Are we in a killer robots arms race right now? When the suspect admits to it, I'm not going to argue the, the law with you. <sighs> New features every week. Newsy Docs presents Sunday nights at 9, 8 central, only on Newsy. Welcome back, folks. It's day three in the trial of the men accused of killing Ahmad Arbery. Newsy's Haley Bull is on the ground in Georgia covering the case for us. Haley, you've been watching this trial unfold. What are some of the biggest takeaways so far? 
Good evening, Christian. A few takeaways here. There are two very different stories being brought forth by the state and defense attorneys. One argues Arbery was chased and murdered by people who assumed the worst. The other points to concerns about crime in the area and self-defense. Keep in mind, all three defendants are being tried at once. Right now, the state is making their argument. They are very methodically walking through surveillance video images from the scene and calling police who responded to testify. Today, an officer as well as a detective who both talked to defendant Greg McMichael took the stand. We heard parts of the transcript of those conversations. They recount McMichael explained he saw a guy running down the road. His belief it was the same person caught on surveillance video in another home in the neighborhood and that he yelled at Arbery to stop. One quote was phrased in a way to show he quote wasn't playing in her questioning. The prosecutor has tried to show McMichael's lack of evidence of a crime assumption. It was the same person and poke holes in his story. The state showed surveillance video from the day Arbery was shot and killed. It showed Arbery in a property under construction walking around. Take a listen to part of today's testimony. So now did he indicate at this time what he thought the guy should be arrested for? No, ma'am. Right. Didn't say burglary. No, ma'am. Didn't say criminal attempted burglary? No, ma'am. Didn't say trespassing? No, ma'am. Didn't say any crime whatsoever? Not at that time, no, ma'am. Now we expect the state's argument to continue tomorrow morning. Christian? Many thanks for that, Haley. In this case, the defense is basing much of their argument on the citizen's arrest law. So what exactly does that mean? And how could it shape this case? Let's dive in a bit. These types of laws date back more than 150 years and allow citizens to arrest people that they believe committed a crime, meaning a person can physically detain another person until police arrive. These laws originated to justify catching enslaved people who were running away and then returning them to their owners. Arbery was jogging in Brunswick, Georgia in February of 2020 when he was pursued by the three defendants who believed he was responsible for burglaries in the area, even though police never connected him to any of those crimes. A former officer who was first on the scene said Travis McMichael and the other defendants didn't exactly invoke a citizen's arrest when trying to stop Arbery. But when Arbery resisted their attempts to detain him, McMichael shot and killed him. The Georgia legislature repealed the law back in May of this year. Now it only applies to shopkeepers who witness shoplifters and restaurant owners who witness dine and dash customers. Despite the law being repealed, the defendants in the case of Arbery's killing will be tried under the old version of the law that existed during the time Arbery was killed. This bill makes Georgia the first state in the country to appeal its citizen's arrest statute. Today, we are replacing a Civil War era law right for abuse with language that balances the sacred right to self-defense of a person and property with our shared responsibility to root out injustice and set our state on a better path forward. There are still variations of the law in place in most U.S. states. Aside from the citizen's arrest law, the defense in the case of Arbery's killing will use stand your ground and open carry laws as a part of their argument. All right, gang. We're going to head into one of our last intermissions, but don't go anywhere for too long. When you're back, we're diving into the effort to address voter suppression on tribal lands. Why do we have bureaus in Missoula, Nashville, and Tulsa? Because we want to tell the whole story. When you look at it from your child's perspective, they don't see the world the way we do anymore. And elevate voices from all over the country. There are times when you're just trying to keep your head above the water. We believe that people are at the heart of a good news story. So you've lived in this area all your life? All my life. We're in the midst of an amazing revolution. It's probably going to be the biggest challenge of all. It's through their eyes that we gain perspective and better understand how news impacts them. Technology is changing, but you can't kill love. It's about the whole community stepping up to help. And how it affects you. Newsy. Watch free 24-7. Ever since the 2020 election, voting rights have been in the spotlight, whether it's attempts to expand or restrict access. Currently, on the federal level, there is an attempt to try and undo decades of voter suppression for indigenous people through the Native American Voting Rights Act. National correspondent Vanessa Mashanya takes us to Navajo Nation 
to see how the passage could give more people a chance for their voices to be heard. Native Americans have contributed great things to this country, our freedoms, and even to democracy all around the world. Beneath Window Rock, a Navajo nation, a memorial is dedicated to the co-talkers of World War II, Navajo soldiers who used their native tongue to create an uncrackable secret cipher. If it wasn't for the Navajo co-talkers, we would have not won World War II. President of Navajo Nation Jonathan Nez is proud of everything his people have contributed to the United States, despite everything that's been taken away. That is why he believes it is only right to make sure the voices of the Navajo and the other 574 Native tribes are heard. We need the federal government once again to fulfill their obligation and to protect the rights of Indigenous peoples here in this country, and that includes voting. It should be easier. It's by standing in Navajo Nation that one can begin to truly feel the reach of the land. Located in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, it is more than 27,000 square miles and is the largest Native American reservation in the country. It's even bigger than the state of West Virginia. Getting around in general, can be difficult, but navigating to a ballot box for many is nearly impossible. The truth is Native Americans have to travel sometimes over a hundred miles to get to a ballot box. That's crazy. <laughs> Jacqueline DeLeon is an attorney with the Native American Rights Fund, a nonprofit dedicated to fighting injustices against Native communities. She says that distance is not the only setback to voting in Indian country. Many homes don't have addresses, making voting by mail tough, and some only speak their native languages. An act is up for debate on the federal level that will help bring down those unique barriers. It creates a federal mandate that there has to be polling places on the reservation. And it also means that there are accommodations for things like people that don't have addresses and gets them ways that they can register to vote. What Delion is talking about is the Native American Voting Rights Act, which is right now being included in the larger John Lewis Voting Rights Act. It would also make tribal ID cards viable for voting purposes, and it will create a task force to keep tabs on inequities. Though some politicians have said this act will only open the door to voter fraud, the Native American Voting Rights Act has bipartisan support and hope is high that it will pass. For President Jonathan Nez, this means giving his people a chance to be heard that they may never have gotten before. We'll protect the Native American vote into the future, not just for us right now, but for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations to come. I'm Vanessa Mishani reporting. Much appreciated, Vanessa. This year, we've seen a series of laws pop up in multiple states which restrict transgender students from playing in organized sports. Civil rights groups already filed a lawsuit against the law in Tennessee, which took effect back in March. National correspondent Usher Qureshi talked to some students impacted by the restrictions and shows us a new national campaign which aims to explain why all kids should get a chance to play and compete in any sport they want. From an early age, Sivan Kotler Berkowitz loved playing sports. I played basketball and football during recess and Little League baseball and soccer. But in seventh grade, the Massachusetts teen felt it was time to transition. I said, hey mom, like, hey dad, I know you know me as like a female, but that's actually not right, like I'm a boy. He was nervous that he'd be made fun of. People wouldn't accept him and what this could mean for his athletics. I definitely worried about it. I knew I wanted to make the switch from the female team, from the girls team to the boys team because that was where I belonged. Already 10 states have passed laws limiting trans youth from school sports. Another 21 states have considered similar bills this year. What these like bills do is they um, basically allow people's gender to be questioned. And that's happened to me and that's violating and embarrassing. 14-year-old Rebecca Bruzhoff, a New Jersey ninth grader and transgender youth activist, has been playing field hockey since fourth grade. 
She's now on her school's freshman team. When it comes down to it, she's just a, a player on the field like any other girl out there. Along with other transgender and non-binary student athletes and their parents, Rebecca and Sivan are trying to educate others about the issue. We want to let our kids live their lives and figure it out on their own. And when they do, they're all stronger for it, right? My kid who's trans, your kid who's not trans, they're all going to figure it out and live a better life and build a better world because of it. Sports are really have to try hard. The Play It Out campaign launched this week promotes the idea that all children, including transgender and non-binary kids, should have equal access to organized sports and athletics. These lawmakers are putting that out of the question because they're only thinking about the threat that trans kids are, but we're not. We're just happy, smiling young people trying to be ourselves and play sports and have fun while doing it. Rebecca's awesome and she works really hard and she's a fantastic defensive player, um, but she's not the star of the team. She's not out there crushing people. She is working so hard to keep up and to contribute positively. Through the Play It Out campaign, these young activists say they are fighting for a chance to step out onto the field and be their authentic selves. They want to use their platform to help other kids who don't have the same support. Don't give up because there's these like adults saying that you can't and trying to make these rules that you can't. And if you love it, like don't give up on it. I'm Asha Qureshi reporting. Much appreciated, Usher. This next piece is a reminder that it's never too late to learn something new. For a long time, Southern West Virginia relied on the coal industry for jobs. But now, the industry has largely vanished, leaving some people to look for new ways to make a living. National correspondent Matt Pearl shows us how a new initiative there is pushing former coal workers towards a whole new profession, one where they will be going after something a little sweeter. The places that raise and mold us sometimes never let go. I love these mountains. And when we feel they're overlooked or ignored, we fight for them. There's no other place I'd want to be, you know. James Cyphers is a lifelong West Virginian. It's beautiful. So is Randy Smith. All the wilderness you can imagine. They know most people outside their state will likely never pass through it. But they preach for it. They fight for it even through a few buzzy boxes. The most fascinating thing I've ever fooled with. <laughs> Their backyards are bee yards. Both Cyphers and Smith produce hives of local honey. It's amazing how the queen, she'll create other queens knowing that one of them will actually kill her because she's more interested in, in the longevity of the hive. In West Virginia, one queen has reigned for decades over a drying hive. I grew up in Coal City. It's not in its heyday anymore. Smith worked in the coal industry his entire life. Cyphers did for years until the work went away. It's home to me, but it's just a run down now because most of the coal mines are gone now. And it's not the people's fault, you know. It's just the location and, and uh, the economy. Across the country, communities that thrived on one industry have been forced to change. Wisconsin is losing a dairy farm a day. The Carolinas used to hold so many jobs in textiles and clothing before machines took over. In West Virginia, coal mines employ a tenth of what they used to. It's difficult for some to let go of the past. To some extent, that's all of us. Mark Lilly oversees the Appalachian Beekeeping Collective. Does this initiative have anything directly to do with coal? No, I don't, I don't think so. But they can't help but intersect. Their facility stands on an old summer camp for coal miners' children. <laughs> Their mission, training beekeepers to produce natural honey, is a new lane in a region that needs them. The drawbacks to those regions are how inaccessible they are, but that's what makes it so perfect for the opportunity of beekeeping. With five, six, seven years experience, it'll be easy for somebody to earn twenty or $30,000 a year, Frames. which again may sound like a little bit, but if that's more than your county's average annual income, that's big. Yeah. Are there any overlaps between what it's like to work in a coal mine and what it's like to work out here? No, not, not at all. It's, to it's totally, totally different. I don't Cyphers is retired now, so is Smith. Beekeeping to them is a hobby. For some, it may become a career. It will never remotely usurp the queen. Maybe that's okay. For so many in this state, 
leaving the place they love, the place that raised them, is not up for debate. The point is to fight. If we replace one piece of a large puzzle with 10 smaller pieces that are at least, or in my opinion, better, that's fine. Instead of complaining about, oh, we've been dealt lemons, like we've got the world's best lemonade. Let's just take advantage of it. In Hinton, West Virginia, I'm Matt Pearl. Much appreciated, Matt. This is the part of the show where we want to collect a swarm of feedback. If you dig this show, or if you think we need to find a new profession, feel free to let me know on social using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. When you're back, we're closing the loop with today's top stories. Welcome back, folks. Before we wrap up, we're going to replay some of today's biggest hits with a segment we call Closing the Loop. First, ahead of the CMA Awards honoring the best of country music, we showed you how women and artists of color are pushing for the industry to be more inclusive. Here's a question for you. What is country music? Picture it in your head. I know what you're probably thinking. White dude, maybe in a cowboy hat singing about his truck or women maybe a cold one or a little bit of whiskey. That may be the brand of country music you still hear most on the radio, but it doesn't include a whole lot of other music that is still a part of the genre and a growing part at that. Studies done by musicologist Jada Watson of the University of Ottawa found that just 10% of songs played on country radio stations are by women, and that number goes down to 2.3% for artists of color. When you're pursuing music, um finances can be the make or break for you. And I mean, like sometimes you're trying to make decisions about whether or not you're gonna pay your rent or you're gonna do a demo or you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna shoot a video or you're gonna eat. And I think, especially for artists of color, you have these, these added barriers and hurdles that you're trying to get through in trying to make it in a genre where you're not like overly represented. And we dove into the history of a law that's the focus of the trial involving the murder of Ahmaud Arbery. In this case, the defense is basing much of their argument on the citizen's arrest law. So what exactly does that mean? And how could it shape this case? Let's dive in a bit. These types of laws date back more than 150 years and allow citizens to arrest people that they believe committed a crime, meaning a person can physically detain another person until police arrive. These laws originated to justify catching enslaved people who were running away and then returning them to their owners. Arbery was jogging in Brunswick, Georgia in February of 2020 when he was pursued by the three defendants who believed he was responsible for burglaries in the area, even though police never connected him to any of those crimes. A former officer who was first on the scene said Travis McMichael and the other defendants didn't exactly invoke a citizen's arrest when trying to stop Arbery. But when Arbery resisted their attempts to detain him, McMichael shot and killed him. The Georgia legislature repealed the law back in May of this year. Now it only applies to shopkeepers who witness shoplifters and restaurant owners who witness dine and dash customers. Despite the law being repealed, the defendants in the case of Arbery's killing will be tried under the old version of the law that existed during the time Aubrey was killed. And there you have it, folks. That's it for this episode of In The Loop. I'm your host, Christian Bryant. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. More of the latest news coming up right here on Newsy. <laughs>